our great co-hosts from the Texas Back Institute, Rick Geyer and Jack Ziegler. And it's my special honor to introduce our guest tonight, Dr. Jim Schuster, MD, PhD. He's a chief of neurotrauma at the University of Pennsylvania. It's customary to have conflict of interest declarations. And aside from my unwavering love for the Texas Back Institute and its uh, great surgeons there, um, I have a complete conflict of interest regarding Dr. Schuster. He's a former fellow of ours and a former resident at the University of Washington. And I've loved his work. We've just talked about some of his uh, great articles. And uh, he was so kind to jump in for the UPenn when there was a family emergency with our previous other speaker from UPenn. So kudos to him to always being available. And uh, we are so lucky to have you here tonight, Jim. And I think you picked a great topic uh, from what I gather, ankylosing spondylitis fractures. We just talked about that the other day and how this is such a growing problem. So uh, Jack, uh, Rick, do you wanna add anything to the intro? No, we're just happy to have him on there. And uh, thanks for filling in. And you know, being from Penn, my alma mater, I'm always uh, excited to have people from that, that part of the country. So absolutely. So, uh, so Jim, uh, take it from here. Share my screen then, is that right? Or yes, that'd be great. Um, well, uh, again, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I saw Jens' name pop up on my, my phone the other day. I was very excited to talk to him. And, uh, uh, um, you know, it, it, as, as everyone that knows Jens Chapman uh, will uh, say, he's one of the most enthusiastic uh, people you'll ever meet. And, and uh, his enthusiasm has always been infectious in that regard. So, um, I'm gonna uh, uh, speak to you today about percutaneous stabilization of thoracolumbar fractures and you know, predominantly in an ankylosing spondylitis and dish and then some of the other ankylosing type conditions that we see that really can't be classified in, in one category or another. I have, I have uh, no financial uh, relationships to disclose. And you know, as, as I give this talk, you'll see instrumentation and equipment uh, that you know is readily recognizable. I would just say that this is not intended to be an advertisement or endorsement for any of those. It really only represents the resources available at my institution. And the only other thing I would say is uh, some of these uh, illustrated techniques would be considered, you know, what I would say physician directed or off label, such as spinal instrumentation without arthrodesis. Um, in terms of learning objectives, uh, you know, we'll briefly discuss the, the pathophysiology, pathophysiology and management of these traumatic fractures. And you know, anyone that has, has managed these fractures realizes they're extremely, uh, can be uh, very complex and very difficult patients to manage. And then uh, I'll be focusing on our experience uh, predominantly at Penn with the percutaneous stabilization of, of these fractures and how that, how that evolved over time um, you know, in, in dealing with these difficult patients. So, um, you know, as, as Jen said, I've, I've known him for a very long time. I had the opportunity to, to train uh, uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle. And, um, you know, this is a, a list of, you know, uh, fabulous mentors and, and uh, colleagues uh, that I learned so much from. And, you know, to this day, I remember back, you know, to the lessons I learned at the University of Washington. And so, uh, I tip my hat to each and every one of them. And, uh, and uh, again, um, uh, just really, really a very influential time in, in my development. So, you know, I won't bore you with definitions, but, you know, uh, we'll focus primarily on DISH or, you know, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. And, you know, we all know what it looks like. It's, you know, these, you know, flowing anterior osteophytes. Oops. Uh, you know, in, in the cervical spine, or or also in the in the um, in the thoracolumbar spine. Um, you know, it's one of those things. Is, you know, you you recognize it immediately when you see it on a plain X-ray. I guess you know we don't see plain X-rays these days on the CT scan, certainly. Um, and then uh, you know, you know, we talk about differentiating it from ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, you really don't get the same uh, ankylosis of the of the facet joints 
and uh, certainly not the sacroiliac erosion or other sort of pathognomonic features of angst bond. And you know, this is a paper from the, the mid 90s, you know, recognizing you know dish and other conditions as a you know as a a, a unique entity with in the realm of spine trauma, uh, and then you know really need to be aware of of the condition itself and uh, you know how to manage these patients. And um, one of the the probably the most important things is that you know we you know we call these traumatic injuries, but you know we've all seen what otherwise would be you know trivial traumas, you know people falling backwards from standing. You know, uh, you know, often really not anything that you would, you know, consider a high velocity sort of type of injury. Uh, and to this day, you know, these these images are missed. And I'll show you one of the cases, or I'll show that in one of the cases that I'll present is even in the era of, you know, high quality CT scans and even MRI scans. If if you don't have a high index of suspicion, you can miss these fractures. Uh, and uh, you know, there is a, there is an incidence of neurologic injury. And especially when, the, when those injuries are missed very often in, um, and I'll mention it in, in, in a few slides, that's very often how they represent, they represent with a new neurologic injury. And again, the, the, the predominant, uh, mechanism is, is hyperextension and, uh, you know, DISH and especially Anxpond is, is a kyphosing disease. I mean, these patients generally have a uh, you know, a, a exaggerated uh, thoracic uh, um, kyphosis, and you know, probably uh, contributes to to the the pathophysiology of the injuries that we see. Um, again, uh, you know, angst bond. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know. Again, when you see it, you know exactly what it is. It, it's an you know, inflammatory disease. Again, very often with sacroiliac joint involvement high incidence of HLA B27, uh, although generally, we're, you know, we're not, we're not checking for that uh, unless there's some, some other reason to do that with these patients. And again, the very characteristic, you know, uh, uh, fusion across the disc spaces, but without that flowing osteophyte anteriorly fusion across the facets. And again, the, the, the key point being that, that exaggerated kyphosis or that, that fixed kyphosis that these patients often have. And you know, here's the. This was a Harborview experience. Um, uh, uh, I guess this paper, paper is from um, 2010. Uh, you know, uh, you know, very extensive experience, very well thought out paper about you know, you know, how you recognize these injuries, how you manage these patients, um, and so um, and. Uh, to the point I made before is in this case, almost 20% of the patients had a delayed diagnosis. And again, in 2010, it wasn't for lack of high quality imaging or any, you know, any, any other issue that way. It's just, you know, it's, it's the nature of the problem. And then when these patients represented, it was with new neurologic injury. And so I think, you know, it's, um, um, uh, you know, you know, we all, when we see these, uh, these injuries, even when they're not like displaced, I always get very nervous because I, I, I just, you know, it's, it's, it's very often, uh, even, even, you know, when you try to classify these fractures is very, it's sometimes very difficult to know exactly how unstable these injuries can be. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that, that they showed, there is a high incidence of symptomatic epidural uh, uh, hematoma. I mean, I'm, I'm sure at your institutions, you know, it seems like my radiologists read epidural hematoma on every single MRI scan. <laughs> you know, involving a fracture, but, uh, you know, it's, it's generally, unless they're on anticoagulation, you know, this is the patient population where it really can be a problem. And, uh, this is, a you know, we talk about trivial injury. Uh, this is just a, a short paper that we present, we, uh, published several years ago and it was, it was two patients. Uh, I think perhaps they didn't, uh, wasn't recognized that they had ankylosing spondylitis. They were undergoing um, uh, revision hip surgery. So they were positioned, uh, in a more supine position, their upper body wasn't, uh, uh, supported and, uh, they both had iatrogenic, uh, hyperextension injuries with, with resultant paraplegia, uh, both requiring surgical intervention. So again, you know, this, you know, this is sort of the ultimate, you know, trivial injury. It's just the weight of the body, the unsupported weight of the body, you know, literally cracking these patients in half.
and again, you know, there are other, other, you know, what I call, you know, spondyloarthropathies, not otherwise, you know, specified or other ankylosing conditions, advanced degenerative disease that don't quite meet the criteria for ank spondyl dish, uh, or, um, you know, we see in our population, a lot of what I call repeat customers, it's for whatever reason, these poor patients are prone to falls. And so you'll see, you know, we'll have done a long segment fusion on, on these patients. They'll come back after a fall and fracture below or above, and then we'll have to extend them. So that, that's actually a very, a very common uh, problem and a big, big concern. Uh, Cause if anything, you know, we're making the spine stiffer, which obviously can be a problem. And, you know, you know, we always describe these fracture like a long bone, the slurry, how they fracture. Again, it's mostly a hyperextension mechanism with trivial trauma. And again, to this day, very often uh, can be missed. Um, and, you know, as a general principle, these require multi-level uh, fixation above and below as, as they really are very unstable fractures. And, you know, I always say uh, a, a dish or an angspawn patient with significant back pain has a fracture until proven otherwise. And you got to keep looking until you rule it out. And if you don't see it on CT, then MRI, but, you know, you really have to, you know, look and make sure, especially in people with, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, large body habitus where the imaging maybe is not quite as good. You know, we, we talk about spine precautions, but, you know, you know, I stress this to our trainees is, you know, you really have to support the spine above the fracture. So they're not hyperextending. Um, you know, very often they're extremely uncomfortable and anxious if you try to lay them flat, but you know, that's the traditional, you know, spine precautions, you know, strapped to a, a hard backboard, but you really have to, to support their spine to sort of keep them out of that hyperextension. Um, we had a patient several years ago where, you know, we, you know, we took all precautions to do that. And the minute they went to the MRI scanner, the tech yanked the pillow out from behind their shoulder and the patient started having symptoms in their lower extremities. And again, you know, why get an MRI? I, I, if I can get it, I'll, I'll get it. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we are looking for things that, you know, like epidural hematoma. And the other thing too, is what I'm looking for is, you know, even with a patient with a neurologic deficit, do you need to do a decompression? Because obviously that'll factor in to how you manage these patients. And um, so, you know, just the fact that they have neurologic injury doesn't necessarily mean that they need decompression. They may need realignment. And I think the MRI is, is useful in that regard. So uh, I think what I'll do is I'll sort of blend into, uh, you know, or, or sort of move on to a case. And this is probably one of the first cases that we, that we utilized a, a, a minimally invasive um, uh, technique for, and it was, it's certainly more than 10 years, uh, 10 years ago. And it, you know, this is the sort of case that really made us start thinking about, you know, is this something we can do in a minimally invasive way? And it's a perfect example. It's an 89 year old woman fell downstairs, two or three stairs, came in with severe back pain. She was neurologically intact, but she has a pacemaker. She has significant, uh, congestive heart failure. She had a uh, a, a right atrial thrombus for, for which she was on Coumadin. She also had other injuries, rib fractures, bilateral um, and um, wrist fractures. And she had, this, she had a known history of ankylosing spondylitis. And there, you know, those are her images. You can see that, you know, she's, you know, uh, these are sort of midline and off to the side. So, you know, a, a, a pretty significant fracture um, in one that certainly we would be concerned about, uh, instability, uh, and, uh, you know, this is something that generally we would address in, in a surgical, in a sur surgical manner. And in her case, she really couldn't have an MRI because she had, you know, you know leads that were, you know, left in her heart that weren't MRI compatible. And, and in addition to that, because of her congestive heart failure, she really couldn't tolerate laying flat, um, you know, significant medical comorbidities, uh, high cardiac risk. You know, this is the one, you know, where, you know, the cardiac surgeons are, or the cardiac the cardiologists are really sort of very hesitant to, to allow us to do any sort of procedure at all. And, and in her case, you know, because of um, uh, uh, her comorbidities, you know, they were they really wanted her to go back on Coumadin as soon after the procedure as possible. And so, you know, you know, when we took all of these things into account, you know, we're, you know, trying to decide, well, what's, 
what's the best way to treat this patient? And you know, if you look at the options, I mean, obviously bed rest is not a, you know, that's not a, a great, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, you know, a great treatment for this uh, in any way, shape, or form. Um, bracing, again, I think, uh, you know, you know, as as unstable as these fractures can be, I'm not sure that bracing is necessarily a a great a great way to treat this. Again, this is a very large woman with with comorbidities, not generally some, someone that would even tolerate a brace. And so it really came down to, you know, some sort of traditional open procedure, which is the way we would have done it prior, or some sort of percutaneous stabilization. And this is really at a time when we're really starting to at least um, you know, investigate the possibility of doing these in a minimally invasive fashion. And so just some of the, the intraoperative considerations, I mean, I, you know, people feel differently about, you know, uh, neuromonitoring, you know, I live in a city uh, where, you know, it's a very litigious part of the world. And so, you know, I think, you know, neuromonitoring probably gets used to, you know, too much or to a fault, certainly on cases that I don't necessarily need, uh, would need it. Uh, in this case, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an advocate, I think, uh, just because, um, uh, you know, of the potential for, for displacement of, of the fractures with, um, you know, with uh, positioning, I think it's, it's not unreasonable to, um, uh, you know, to consider monitoring. And so in, in, in generally in most of these cases, we would do pre and post flip monitoring to make sure that, that at least there hadn't been any significant change. Um, and then, uh, you know, when you're, you know, talking about using, uh, you know, navigation uh, and things, you know, uh, really then you're, uh, by and large, uh, you know, you need, uh, the, the best way to do it is with some sort of radiolucent table. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, we'll, we'll talk briefly about the, the, you know, the instrumentation and, and some of the other, uh, you know, issues and pitfalls, especially with this particular condition. So, um, you know, the, these uh, generally, you know, as we talked about, these patient these patients have a pre-morbid, you know, kyphotic alignment, and so um, uh, when I do these cases, uh, you know, basically, I want to. Uh, my goal generally is to fix them in their in their in their previous alignment, uh, and then so you know, generally uh, would not use the standard you know, open belly, like a Jackson table where they, you know, everything, you know, tends to hyperextend. And so we generally would use, in this case, my standard is to use the, the radiolucent uh, Wilson or the, the, or the equivalent. Uh, and so to turn the patient on to sort of try to reduce those fractures, because very often they are sort of fish mouthed. Um, just as, you know, um, you know, as, uh, you know, as, as part of this, you know, at least the one we use is only rated up to 300 pounds. And so, um, you know, uh, you know, and even at, even at that, that thing's screaming for its life, uh, you know, as you lay these big patients on it. The other thing is, uh, if you've used this is, and I don't know if you can see my, uh, my cursor, but, um, um, the, there's a, there's a metal cog inside this. So it's not, it's not completely radiolucent. Uh, and so it, it, it will interfere with uh, the, either with uh, intraoperative CT or sometimes the biplanar fluoro. And so sometimes what you have to do is reverse the, depending on which level of the spine you're operating on, you have to reverse the, 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 the Wilson frame to keep that, uh, keep that metal artifact out of the way. And then, you know, we generally use, uh, you know, the, for, for our imaging uh, and, you know, certainly you can, uh, you can do, uh, you know, uh, you can use uh, C arm. Um, um, you know, my my uh, orthopedic colleagues at uh, Shock Trauma, Dan Gelbin, Steve Ludwig are very very facile with you know using K wires and and you know bi biplanar fluoro. It certainly is 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 much more time consuming. And so, you know, this is generally the setup that we use, which is the uh, in this case it's the O arm. Um, uh, and but again, there are you know. Just like everything else, there are different varieties. You know, two or three different you know manufacturers that make this. Again, this is the one that we use, and it works perfectly fine. Um, and then we you know use some sort of um, uh, 
of a navigating system. And in this case, we use the, the stealth system, which, um, you know, it sort of pairs very, very well with, uh, um, uh, with, with the ORM. But again, none of these are perfect. Um, the advantage of the CT based systems is the image quality is much better. Uh, the navigation tends to be a little bit more real time. And, and it, I mean, they say it's mobile, but it's, you know, it's like moving around a, like a semi trailer sometimes. Um, uh, it has a big footprint and, and it has a big price. I mean, these things are expensive and they break down. And so, you know, the upfront cost for these is, is probably one of the, the things that deters most places from, from buying them because uh, they are very expensive. And again, this is the, it would be sort of one of the standard um, uh, um, setups the, um, in terms of the interoperative navigation. So there, there's a, a fiducial array that attaches through a small incision to generally to a spinous process, or you can put it on the iliac crest. And then we use uh, navigated drill guides uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, drills and then uh, K-wires and then uh, these posted screws over the top. Um, the one thing that we do find is uh, because these fractures can be extremely unstable is what, what we generally do now is uh, shoot the screws below and then move the array or use a second array and put it uh, for shooting the screws above because um, not only does your accuracy decrease the farther you are away from the, the fiducial array, but there's, there's enough motion uh, even with breathing that it can introduce um, error. And so as standard practice, uh, we would um, uh, use a two array system. Um, the other thing that we'll do all very often, is, especially if we're gonna do decompression, if we are gonna do some focal decompression at the, at the level of the fracture is we'll shoot the bottom screws, make a mid, small midline incision, do the decompression, perhaps lay some bone in if we're gonna do that. And then we'll move the array and shoot the upper screws. So we sort of incorporate that into it. So that is a, that is a pitfall here that, um, you know, trying to shoot all the screws from the array below an unstable fracture generally is not advisable. And so this is the, uh, uh, the, 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 our, our first patient. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, three levels above, three levels below. Uh, you can see your pacemaker and the, and the, the dead leads that, that didn't uh, allow us to, uh, to get um, uh, MRI, MRI imaging. Uh, but, you know, you look at that's, that's seven levels of, of instrumentation, 100 cc's of blood loss, no postoperative complications. I don't generally brace these patients. The advantage, especially in the patients that don't need decompression, is you, you can start them back on anticoagulation very soon afterwards. There's no drains. And, you know, when we follow this lady up uh, four years later, uh, doing very, very well, with, uh, you know, uh, back to, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, functioning with, uh, with the aid of her family. So, uh, you know, that was the, you know, the, our, our first sort of uh, uh, percutaneous case. And again, you know, you know, it, these are techniques that are, are good for the extremes. They're good for old sick people and they're good, as you'll see, for a very large patient. So, um, you know, if, if you're looking for indications, I think, uh, you know, you, you know, would you have to do this for, for every patient? No, but in this patient population, there's a lot of old sick people and there's a lot, as it turns out, a lot of very big people. And these techniques lend themselves very well to those to when you're, when you're running on the extremes. And uh, we uh, had a short, uh, we pub published our first 11 cases uh, with this technique. And as you can see, the average age was 77. Uh, you know, with a BMI of 34, so relatively large patients, all high-risk anesthesia patients. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, but, you know, generally in this patient population, uh, a very, a very acceptable, you know, uh, um, uh, outcomes with regard to, uh, you know, uh, fusion and, um, and uh, you know, lack of, of postoperative complications. Uh, our original report was 11. Now we're somewhere over 50, 50 of these patients. So a pretty, a pretty significant number, uh, um, you know, a, a, a pretty good experience with these, with these techniques. Um, and again, it reduces physiologic stress to these patients. Um, again, multiple comorbidities, uh, the fractures heal, uh, um, uh, you know, generally not doing direct arthrodesis. 
uh, if we, you know, if we were doing focal decompression, generally we would lay some bone in at that time, but otherwise not putting any bone in, no post-operative bracing and, and overall very, very good uh, functional outcome um, long-term. And uh, I mean, you know, you know, what's, what's the limit? Well, this is a patient that had um, two non-contiguous uh, fractures and this is 10 levels percutaneous. So, um, um, you know, that, you know, I mean, you know, so a very, you know, uh, even in a, an extreme case, you know, again, this was an old sick person uh, and, uh, you know, uh, done, in you know in, you know the workflow once you get used to it is actually pretty good the screws go in very quickly and you know there's you, there's a little bit of nuance to getting the rods you know under the fascia and and through the through the screws and getting them locked down but um you know uh, it's it's like anything you, you get better at time with these sorts of things and this is um again we have uh, now we're up to 52 patients um, uh, we really try hard to, to keep track of our spine trauma patients, you know, uh, you know, it's a, for me, it's an investment in time because, you know, we keep track of these and then, you know, at the very least you can find the names of the patients and go back with, uh, with, uh, you know, the electronic medical record. But, you know, uh, I, you know, I think, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, really, you know, for us, you know, you know, keeping track of the data uh, you know, is very important. And so, and it's, you know, especially for projects like this. All right. So, um, we'll move on to a second case. And again, this is a case of an extreme, uh, this is a, uh, a 55 year old, uh, gentleman and, you know, is a car versus pedestrian. And when I say car versus pedestrian, it basically sort of bumped him and he fell over backwards. Uh, and then that was the extent of his injury, but he's, 450 pounds and five foot eight. So, you know, BMI 68. Um, uh, and, you know, this is a, this is a case from, you know, a few, you know, you know, not that long ago, you've seen it at an outside hospital and at least by report, he had negative imaging and, you know, we weren't able to get that imaging. Uh, but it, you know, it just goes back to the, to the fact that, you know, if you have this fracture and it's initially not displaced and you have a guy that weighs 450 pounds, it may not be readily apparent you know, when you're looking for that fracture. So, um, I know he was discharged from the ER, showed up at another hospital because all of a sudden he couldn't move his legs. Uh, they didn't bother to do any imaging and they just sent him our way. Uh, and, and when he got to us, he was uh, Asia B with about a T11 sensory level. And that's his fracture. So, and again, you know, hyperextension, and this is a guy that doesn't quite fit the criteria for AS or DISH. Uh, but, you know, you can see from the sort of the, the marginal ossifieds, our sense was that he had fractured through an ankylo segment there. And so we managed this as if we'd managed it, like a hyperextension injury in one of these ankylos patients. And so, you know, back to the, the considerations here. So this is, um, uh, you know, he's, he's out in his legs. And so you could argue that... Um, you know, not a tremendous amount of utility to, um, to using monitoring, um, you know, you know, you can, you know, certainly can use it and get no signals and just be happy that there are no signals. But in this case, um, uh, we, we chose not to, um, you know, uh, sometimes with these very big patients too, the needles are a long way from the muscle. And so, um, you know, this is, you know, even, you know, uh, even if you want to use it very often, the, the, it's, uh, the, the technique's not great. Um, and then, you know, how do you position a, a 450 pound patient? Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the instrumentation again. So again, our Wilson frame only goes up to 300 pounds. And so, uh, you know, the options then are, you know, flat Jackson with, with chest and hip bolsters, uh, um, uh, we, um, the other thing that we'll do is we'll put two chest bolsters side by side. So it gives them a little bit of support and then the hip bolsters and that still overall, you know, especially with a large belly gives them, you know, that sort of, uh, the, 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 the kyphotic alignment. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of, 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 you know, using the, the Jackson or the equivalent for, you know, you know, the sort of rotating these, 
some of it is too. And I don't think it works quite as well as when you put them on it when you put them on a um, uh, uh, on the, the Wilson frame. Uh, and so our tendency is just to you know all hands on deck and, and turn these people over as, as as gently as we can. And then you know you can imagine what 450 pounds looks like on that skinny Jackson table. I mean we you know uh, you know strapped him down, taped him down. But you know during the case he would sort of you'd see him listing to one side and we'd have him rotate the table back the other way. And, you know, at one point we sort of jostled him with the, the um, with the O-arm as we're going around it. And, um, you know, it's, you know, sort of, you know, it's so, you know, it's, you know, operating on these very large patients, no matter what you're doing is, you know, just, just the sheer positioning alone is, is an, an immense undertaking. And again, in this case, uh, you know, sort of the standard thing, two arrays, one above and one below. And we generally would go at least three levels above and below. The other thing too is, um, uh, and in this case, we did not do any decompression. Um, uh, if you, the, unfortunately, the, the MRI didn't project that well, but if you look at the MRI scan, there's really not much compression. And I think this really was like in a dynamic or a positional sort of compression of the spinal cord. So. You know, especially with as, as as big a man as this is, we're trying to minimize the the number of incisions that we made on his back. Um, with regard to the to the you know uh, you know when you pass the rods uh, you know under the fascia through the screws, uh, we tend to you know I say you bend the rods true. You don't really want to, um, especially in these cases, you you don't want to be using like the persuade or anything to lock those screws in because um, what it does is just force them, force them, uh, you know, they'll open up that fracture again. So you bend the rods true or in a, in a somewhat kyphotic alignment, you know, as you're tightening the screws down, you tighten the screws closest to the fracture first, and that tends to, to, to help with the reduction. And in this case, we, we did some compression, you know, to try to get this thing aligned. And again, it, our, my experience with this is it doesn't have to be perfect is if you get it realigned uh you know generally that they, they will heal and, and heal across the the fractured segment and again um in this case we chose not to do any decompression uh you know when would you do decompression well you know if you saw stenosis uh you know in a you know in a, you know it, other than through malalignment Certainly, if you see epidural hematoma, uh, you know you you would consider a decompression. But it, uh, especially in the neurologic intact patients, by and large, generally most of these patients don't need decompression. And then th those are that's our um, our construct. Uh, you know, uh, three above and three below, incorporating the levels right at the level of the fracture. Again, trying to uh, you can see the rods are bent slightly slightly kyphotic, you know, trying to, trying to push that fracture together. And we did compress a bit. Um, and again, it's not perfect. I mean, there's still a little bit of a gap. He's not, uh, he's not uh, fish mouth anymore, which is good. And so generally in, in our experience in something like this is something that he certainly will heal even without any true arthrodesis. And so again, you know, uh, hundred cc's of blood loss, uh, we kept him in the ICU for um, for a couple of uh, days afterwards, just to keep his blood pressure up. But after 48 hours, he really was sort of auto pressing, and so uh, we didn't, you know, sort of belabor the point. Uh, mobilize him right away without a brace, and even if you wanted to brace this guy, I'm not sure what you would use, or I'm not sure that he would tolerate it. And the, you know, the good thing is, 10 days later, he's you know he's really made significant improvement. Um, you know, he's Asia D essentially. So, you know, he, this, this is a guy that's going to walk again. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's sort of very gratifying, um, very, very gratifying case in that regard. Just keep an eye on the time here. Now, this is a practical point. And so, uh, and, you know, when we first started doing this, our, our, our uh, you know, uh, the billing officers get after us because it's just like, you know, we're, you know, we're so happy. We're like doing these percutaneous things and they're like, we don't know how to build this, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, because, you know, instrumentation alone, that can't be the primary billing code. And so, um, and, um, uh, and so, 
you know, we generally would use an open reduction code. And if obviously if you do laminectomy and, and, and focal orthodesis, then that's the primary code. But um, at least in spine, and, and maybe somebody knows better than I do, but th this is, you know, this, this is the one issue and, and not to focus on billing, but, you know, you know, obviously it's, it's part of the process. Um, you know, that is the one sort of confounding thing with regard to these cases. I mean, you know, is that the instrumentation can't be the primary code uh, when, when you bill these cases. So in conclusion, um, I think, uh, at least in my experience, uh, percutaneous stabilization is a very reasonable option uh, for these hyperextension fractures and, and these ankylosing conditions. And again, it's, I think it's really good for the, for the extremes. Old sick people works great. Um, very large patients where you know, uh, you're worried about making large incisions and, and, uh, and things like that, it works great. Um, works well for everybody in between, but I think, you know, the reason that we started doing this were, were for the extreme cases, because I think, you know, especially the old sick patients, you know, you do a seven or eight level fusion and lose a hundred cc's of blood and you know, start them back on their anticoagulation, you know, within, you know, a few days of the surgery and, uh, you know, minimal, you know, you know, no issues with the wounds and no issues, you know, no need for bracing, I think is, 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 a, is a win certainly for these patients. Um, you know, I would just uh, make a point about navigation in general is uh, what I tell my uh, trainees is you shouldn't learn to put in pedicle screws with navigation. Uh, and, and, and the reason is, is these, you know, these techniques uh, have flaws uh, and uh, if, you know, you know, we were talking a little bit before we started, you know, if you've never put a pedicle screw in without navigation, then you don't realize that, you know, you'd say to yourself, I don't care what the machine says, that's trajectory is wrong. And, you know, fiducial rays get bumped, you know, fractures shift. There's all kinds of reasons that these things can tend that, um, and it's virtual. That's the other thing you have to remember is, you're looking at virtual imaging, it's not real time. And so there are drawbacks. And then, you know, uh, you know, people ask me about robotics and I'm like, well, ro robot robotics are fine, except that robotics is based on navigation. So it's only as good as the navigation. Uh, and then, you know, my only sort of uh, hesitancy is that there's a certain loss of, of haptic feel uh, when, when you sort of introduce something else that's not your hand between uh, the, you, the navigation and the patient. So, um, you know, that's just, just my, my take on these things. Uh, the other thing too, is if you're going to use these techniques, you have to really be the super user of the, the of the equipment. Um, you know, I, I got to the point where I run the OARM myself. I know how to troubleshoot it. I know how to troubleshoot the, the stealth machine. I know how to troubleshoot all the equipment, uh, because, um, you know, I, it was pretty clear early on that that I I had to be able to champion this, um, and so these techniques have their place, uh, but you have to realize the limitations, and you have to realize when if, if you know what I always say is if it's not right, it's not right for a reason. Respin or rescan. Don't don't just assume that the machine's right. Um, so maybe I'll uh, I'll stop there and happy to to answer any questions if people have questions for me. This is Jens. Thank you so much, Jim, for joining us. There's a wealth of knowledge in there, and you've taken this really to a new level. We have a lot of technical points uh, to discuss, and Mark Dekutowski has uh, uh, contributed heavily with thoughts. Uh, we're going to go through this. My first question to you is a very fundamental one, and that is, what have we done wrong? That includes myself and uh, many others in not helping the radiology and the ER doctor community to be more aware of these ankylosing disorders. It still is just, it boggles me. I'm sure it's the same in the Northeast, how many physicians and colleagues, and sometimes even spine colleagues, are dumbfounded or caught by surprise by these ankylosing disorders. And uh, the subtleties do matter, it does matter if it's ang spawn or dish. So what's your thought? Where, where have we gone wrong? What, what have we missed here? Well, I mean, I think, you know, unfortunately people learn by their mistakes and so they'll miss one and then that's how they learn. And so, um, you know, so I don't know. I mean, I think if, you know, you know, the, I'm sure, you know, you're, sometimes our, the problem at our institution, especially overnight is, 
it's a sort of unclear who's reading those films, you know? And so I think, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a musculoskeletal radiologist. It's not necessarily a, a, a uh, and so I think there's a certain level of, of experience. Um, and so I think that's the fundamental problem. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not like these cases are that rare. I mean, you know, we see them all the time. I mean, it's, you know, and so, uh, but, but as you say, I think in, you know, I just think it's one of these things where, you know, uh, and, and, you know, maybe it's, you know, if, if someone, if, if someone asks for a scan and they think that, you know, there's a patient or, you know, if they said, oh, this, they may have dish rank spawn, you know, again, I just have, if, if they have significant back pain, I mean, that patient has a fracture until proven otherwise. I mean, you, you know, it's, uh, you, you have to keep looking, you know, and, and whether it's, you know, uh, you know, MRI scan, which, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's much more difficult and you can miss it on an MRI scan too, but, uh, you know, every one of these that I've seen missed when you go back, it's, it's right there. I mean, you know, I, I you know, I, you know, that's the other problem. So. My, my second question was, um, uh, do we have to pan scan the spine because of non-contiguous fractures and, um, uh, in terms of, uh, stability, are there gradients outside of neurologic injury, which is automatically unstable, uh, are all of these fractures immediately unstable and require surgery? Are there some way you could in good faith um, with the right patient think about giving a trial of non-surgical care? So two questions, non-contiguous injuries and stability determination. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm in the habit of at least with, uh, you know, with CT scan, if I find one, I sort of make sure I've, I've looked at the entire spine. And to your other point, there are certainly, uh, you know, uh, fractures that, you know, don't, don't seem to extend entirely through, you know, all through, you know, through the disc, through the posterior elements, you know, there's sort of that gray area. And I've treated, you know, I've treated those patients in, in uh, uh, external orthosis, but I keep a very close eye on them. So I think, I don't think it's an all or none. I think there are, you know, it's, uh, I mean, you know, it's not quite like AOD, but I mean, I think there is a gradation. I think there are some low, uh, you know, lower risk patients, not every one of them needs a big operation, but I, but making that sort of call, I think takes experience. I mean, I sweat every single one of these and I can tell you everyone that I've treated in a, in a brace, I, I sweat those even more. So, but I, I, but to your point, I don't think all of these patients need a big operation. Robert Huang, uh, uh, great to have you on board, Robert. Uh, he asks, uh, if you see an MRI on um, your, uh, if on MRI you see an epidural hematoma, does that mean you should decompress it, or is that again something that you can make patient specific? Yeah, I mean, I and I'm sure you all do. I, I fight with my radiologists all the time. I'm just like, because you know, I'm, I'm sure you've all had the experience this epidural hematoma. And, you know, what I say to them is, are you telling me there's a signal in the epidural space that could be consistent with blood products, or are you telling me there's a compressive clot? And so I think that's the, and that's the difference. And, you know, I, you know, I, I just, you know, I've had times where I've like, they've said epidural hematoma and I've operated on the patient and I've called the radiologist and said, guess where I am. I'm in the epidural space and guess what's not here. <laughs> There's no blood here. And so, but I think, you know, and so, you know, at least, you know, it just seems like it gets over call, but I, I think in a patient where, it's, it's clearly clotted blood or it looks to be clotted blood and there's compression. Uh, I have a, a, a slightly, uh, I mean, I mean the, the one that's tough is if they're neurologically intact, obviously. And then I, I think that's a judgment call that I don't know that everyone needs a laminectomy. Jim, it's Jack Ziegler, super talk. Do they all heal? Have you had any non-unions or hardware breakage? Is there a difference in healing between uh, AS and, uh, and dish? Um, I mean, I've had, uh, uh, I, I mean, we've had some like hardware pullout. I mean, it, I, they don't all heal. I mean, it's like anything, but I, I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, I, I think what I have had is, you know, some loss of fixation and, you know, some of that, some of that's been, uh, in the patients where, you know, we were, you know, we didn't quite, spend enough time, uh, you know, like contouring the rods and we forced them down below and things like that. I, I, I mean, not going to, I haven't had any, uh, well, 
uh, I've had a few patients that have, uh, have fallen again and, you know, and, and fractured through above and below, but, uh, um, so no, it's not a, obviously it's not a perfect technique and we, you know, we do have, you know, uh, uh, you know, we, you know, we do have, uh, uh, you know, screw pull out and things, but I mean, fortunately I haven't had any like, you know, catastrophic ones where people, you know, lost alignment and, and lost neurologic function. Hey, Jim. I may have missed it, but when you put the screws in, are you putting them manually or using power? Um, I, uh, I use a, a, um, I use a navigated drill guide. I drill, I put a K wire and then I just put the, put the screws over there. I use cannulated screws over the K wire. Okay. Because I was thinking that, you know, the power would be much safer because you said earlier, because they're so unstable. Yeah. That if you're trying to do it manually, I can see you causing more displacement, possibly more damage. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, when we sort of pre-drill them, uh, you know, uh, and then put the k -wire, I mean, you know, it, it doesn't seem to, to uh, you know, um, I mean, it, it, it seems to be, you know, sort of, you know, reasonably gentle, you know, putting them in. So, um, I mean, I can see if you're, you know, using a, a like a pedicle finder or, or things, it, it, it'd be a little bit more difficult, so. I want to uh, comment on um, some of the things that uh, Mark Dekwitowski, who's kindly joined us uh, and who's also published in this domain, uh, talked about. So uh, one thought is uh, neuromodering and positioning. For him, this is, and I, I think you emphasize that really solidly, uh, the critical part when you want to do surgery, not using a turning frame. Um, he thought that, uh, and I'd be curious to hear your comment on that, to keep the patient awake uh, might be, a good idea or waking them up during the turning because the act of turning is one of the critical parts where that patient can through shear or hyperextension pinch off their cord. So what are your thoughts on doing an awake positioning? If we've, uh, I mean, we generally have not, um, I mean, I know, you know, I, I know, uh, Mark has, you know, a lot of experience with, with, uh, you know, scoliosis. And I know a lot of experience with doing like wake up tests, even, you know, uh, and, and things like that. But, um, I mean, uh, I think you'd have to, you know, uh, I think you'd have to, um, uh, you know, you'd really have to have buy-in from the anesthesiologist. I mean, I think it, that would be my only concern that, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, sorry, my wife's yelling in the background at the dog, but, um, uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I just, I don't, I, 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 I may have a hard time, uh, convincing my, my, my anesthesia colleagues to, 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 to do that, so, especially in the 450 pound one. So, but, uh. and then another thing that Mark, um, uh, taught me, but I've not done that is he staggers his screw tops, uh, the screw ends on the top and the bottom. So he just has a unilateral fixation at the top and a unilateral fixation, on the opposite side and the bottom. To take away some of the uh, the stiffness gradient between uninstrument and instrument spine, I think it's just for ang spine, not for dish patients. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? Is that something you've seen? Is that something that's worth uh, considering? It's, it's, it's not something I have any experience with. Mm -hmm. um, so then, um, Antonio Webb, great to have you on board, Antonio. Uh, missed you for the last couple of times. He thought that having one of those um, bending systems that allows you to kind of pre-contour rods might help you get a perfect bend. He said a, a true bend, and that was a really well-chosen word, I thought. Is that something that you find beneficial? Um, he has a product name attached to it. Um, I mean, I, I, I've thought about it. I mean, and I, I think this would be a, a really great technique. I mean, you know, I'll... You know, I'll use the the contours of the screw extensions to you know to you know I'll sort of hold the rod up to the top of those. It's not perfect, but I think uh, I think that would be a you know especially for you know for very difficult uh, uh, for difficult bends because it's you know it's uh, you know when you you know when you push that rod all the way down, and you realize it's not right. You got to take it out and bend it. So you know it, a lot of times there's you know multiple bends you know trying to get this thing right. So. So you still use uh, hand bending and recontour? I, I do it all. I do it all hand hand bending. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then screw purchase. I, I don't want to monopolize the question. So so um, uh, Jack um, or anybody else uh, take it from me. Uh, but you're doing points, great. Don't two stop. points from from Mark and one from me that I'll combine in one question. 
So especially in angst bond, osteoporosis is a real problem and percutaneous screw purchase um, is a bit of an issue. And again, uh, Rod Oscar and my partner and I, uh, Rod's online also here, have had struggles with revising patients after perk screw fixation attempts where there was just insufficient purchase. I'm not sure why that was their technical issues probably, but um, for me, uh, these, uh, these angst bond patients are a true challenge because you really want to get maximum purchase. So do you use uh, cement like an, uh, a fenestrated screws or do you try to kind of go through the cost or a table joint since you go through the trouble of navigation array to gain extra cortices of fixation? So not a true in pedicle fixation. No, I would say very often the, 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 um, the ideal trajectory is, is uh, you know, sort of that in, out, in, or, you know, through the, you know, through the cost of retrieval junction. Uh, so, you know, I would say, uh, you know, you know um, that very often is, is, the, is, the, is the easiest trajectory as you set these up, especially in the thoracic spine. But again, to your point, you know, you know, angst bond, you know, they, you know, they, they, they lay down bone, but it's not great bone. I mean, that's the, you know, that's the problem. And, and you know, I, I think in, you know, you know uh, one of the other questions is about, you know, hardware failure. And I think uh, it, it tends, it seems to be uh, more of an issue in the angst bond patients. And again, it's what well, we see I have is, it's, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the you know, and, and again, uh, you, know, you know, I always hate to blame the patient uh, and so, you know, when I get screws that pull out or, or, or things, you know, I'm always like, you know, could I have done a better job one with the, with the trajectory of the screws and two, making sure those rods really sit in there true. So they're not loading the screws as you, you know, cause you know, those posted screws, I mean, you know, you, you, you know, you can, you know, you, you can load them like a slingshot in a sense, you know, you start cranking that thing down, uh, you know, it's uh, you know, it, it's a machine basically. So you know, when I've had those failures, I, I'm just like, well, fine, you know, I could say it's, it's patient, you know, it's, you know, patient uh, physiology, but, you know, I worry about the fact that, uh, again, that my screw purchase wasn't, you know, or, or wasn't good or that I didn't bend the rods uh, appropriately. Great. Rick, any thoughts from your end? No, I, I thought you did a great job and I like the technique and, uh, what do you think the learning curve is it for the novice that wants to start out do it this way, Jim? Um, I uh, it's um, you know I, I think it's like anything. It's the um, uh, you know getting used to not looking at your hands. You know when you know looking at the screen when you're doing the positioning. And so you know for, for us it's a little bit like endoscopic you know surgery or like laparoscopic surgery. But I, I think it you know you know, people pick it up pretty quickly, you know, pretty quickly. And it's just, you know, it's, you know, there's sort of the nuance, like if you don't like, you know, one of my partners, I remember the first case that he did, he couldn't get the, he couldn't get the, the rod to sit down. And like, if you're not careful, if you don't get the, if you don't get the, the, the rod started under the fascia, if it's above the fascia, you know, between any of those screws, you'll never, you'll never get it locked in place. So he struggled, struggled, struggled. And I came in, I was like, yeah, you, you really have to make sure you're under the fascia, you know, when you, when you, or, or they won't sit down on those screw heads. So. Hey Jim, this is Rod. Um, I just had a couple uh, questions. That was a great presentation. What do you, what is your, um, uh, like, um, OR, uh, algorithm for doing these? Because in our experience, you know, you got to like, if you're doing the angst spondy, Usually it's like four or five levels. It's kind of at the outer limits of. So do you spin twice, and then yeah. and then do you spin at the end? Like how do you know you're in or out? And then or yeah, do you bring a, spin, a CR so in? I would say for these cases, it's it's usually four spins. So it's a it's a spin uh, 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 for the screws above and below, and then I spin at the end to make sure everything looks okay. And um, the the other uh, the other thing with this is when you. Um, it's very often I'll provisionally put the rods in and, and then spin. And that actually gives me a, a pretty good idea of how they're sitting. The, the thing that uh, it's rare that you cut the rod too short. It's very common that the rods too long. Uh, and, you know, you could argue that maybe it doesn't make that much difference, but it's sort of, uh, you, you know, um, so that, that's the biggest that I, I would say that that's the biggest thing is the rods are often very too uh, often too long. So, 
Uh, but I would say the average number, I would say on average, it's four spins for these big cases. And then one other, one last question is, you know, I always feel like, in fact, I just came off call and I had two of these patients um, and they always seem to come in after hours on the weekends. What do you guys do at Penn? Because, I mean, it's, it's hard enough just getting the C-arm tech, you know, you got like, um, what do you guys have? Do you have an in-house um, radiology tech that runs the OR machine or? Yeah, it's, it's me. I, I do the spins myself. I mean, wow. I, just, I went and took the little training course and uh, I mean, when I do it, my, so I'll give you an example. So when I do this case with one of the, one of the residents, I'll have them, I won't scrub it initially. They'll put the, they'll put the array on. I bring the arm in, we spin it. Um, and so uh, I'm as fast as any of the, uh, of the techs. And to your point is if you're there at night with note that with a tech that doesn't know what they're doing, it, it, I mean, it, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing more. Uh, so, um, you know, so when we first started doing this, I was just like, look, I'm going to have to be the super user for this thing. And so I would say that I, I do, more than 90% of the spins myself, so. That's great, I love it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I go get the machine, I bring it in, it, it saves me, like if I had to call the tech every time to do it, it'd add 45 minutes to the case. So, I mean, I bring, as soon as the patient's position, I bring the machine in, we put the array on, I spin it, we put the screws in, we move the array, we spin it again, then we spin at the end, so. Wow. You're they a super resident. <laughs> Jim, neurologically, have you tracked them? Have you had recovery on incomplete uh, paraplegics by stabilization alone? Or have you had any deteriorate neurologically afterwards? Um, uh, well, it's so it's I, I have a low threshold for decompressing the ones that are neurologically, you know, and so and a lot of these people, if you look, I mean, this that last case that I presented, his his canal was wide open. And and so and he's actually made a very good recovery. So my, my inclination, I, I err on the side of decompression, even if it's just vocal, if they have a neurologic injury. So, Well, really good. Thank you so much, uh, Jim, for uh, presenting institution uh, so well. Really an important topic. I hope that all of us carry the message out um, and uh, educate those around us about these fractures. And uh, their perniciousness, and you gave us a lot of great detail. Uh, Jack or Rick, do you want to uh, close us out? Uh, uh, just go ahead, Jack. Oh, go ahead, Rick. You're the Penn graduate. Okay. <laughs> well, Jim, we're, we're happy to have 